Hello everyone. We are continuing our study of Animal Farm today. And we have chapter 9 at our hands. But as usual, a quick recap of what happened in the previous chapter. So the chapter 8 was uh, even harder to read than chapter 7 just before that. And chapter 7 was not a joke. When I first started to read Animal Farm, I thought that this is going to be something not so serious. I thought that it would be a political satire, with uh, uh, just as how satire sometimes used to portray. Uh, it is going to be lighthearted and without a lot of serious stuff. I thought that the author will just show some absurdities in uh, in uh, countries of sort of rivals, right? Absurdity in his rivals and present easy ways to oppose some failures that the enemies had. Something like that. I, I thought that this is going to be very polarized and therefore very easily read through piece of political propaganda. But unfortunately, <laughs> or rather fortunately, <clears throat> this is not the case. This is a very thought through uh, piece of art. It's absolutely timeless, even though it it draws a lot of inspiration from known historical events from Russian Revolution and this hits home very hard. I absolutely sure I know lots of references that uh, the author did here and it stinks to read it to relieve some painful events from the history and understand that it's it's so unnecessary. All this suffering is so unnecessary. <clears throat> I I gotta be honest with you. I'm getting a little bit depressed uh, with uh, the contents here. So in chapter eight, it starts with Napoleon rationalizing his power, uh, or rather the excess of his power excesses of his power when he executed a lot of animals. Uh, while previously in Seven Commandments it was said that no animal should harm or kill any other animals, Napoleon now forged the commandment and I voluntarily use the word forged because it's not like he justifies or explains that some of the principles should be modified. No, he does it everything in very sneaky way of doing it. And he adds two words without cause. So what exactly does that mean and who justifies if this has a cause or not? It's all omitted. Uh, basically, Napoleon says that he knows the cause, therefore all his actions are justified. It's impossible to, to, to read it without without pain, <laughs> but the things are going to get worse. His lackeys, uh, Squealer, Minimus, and some other pigs, I, I, I assumed, they start a full-out cult of personality. Uh, poems and common sayings are introduced uh, just as before it became common for animals to blame everything on the snowball and even if some obvious fault has happened on the farm they would still say that 
Well, obviously, Snowball had to do something with this because, well, why wouldn't it work exactly as we plan? But now the other part of uh, these common sayings are introduced uh, where everything that goes right, it's all attributed to efforts of Napoleon himself. Not his uh, bureaucracy, not his uh, government, not his close servants or somebody else, but directly to Napoleon. And uh, on top of all of that, there are some poems, some celebrations of Napoleon's birthday, and so on and so forth. And this is. This reminds a lot of what happened with the cult of personality of Stalin's, uh, which started when Stalin was about, if I'm not mistaken, 50 years old, at, at the heights of his power. And everything that happened in Soviet Union was that was good was attributed exactly to him. Maybe not in such naive way as uh, it's shown here but still with the same manner disgusting manner uh, that well he is the best friends friend of all sportsmen he is the best friend of all scientists of all workers and it was mentioned something like that in so many ways in so many public well I, I i wanted to say media sources but of course it's wasn't full out media at the time but news sources radio and whatnot and it is the reminder of that especially now that we know what actually happened how everything was at the moment. The, the, those painful comparisons are hitting very close to the home. And this, yeah. So Napoleon tries to play a strategist. He plays with other farmers, human farmers, trying to find a better deal for timber that he has on animals farm and he tries to strike an agreement with one farmer then breaks it in exchange for the agreement with the other one and he changes his narrative just all the way to the entirely opposite so well with a with, uh, propaganda that is just preposterous on, on the same level that farmers once tried to spread propaganda that animal farm is basically a torture house for all animals now Napoleon and his lackey spread propaganda that well th that far farmer that he is not currently striking a deal with uh, that farmer is the worst ever he tortures he kills and he is not to be trusted but but then on the other day he might change his mind and all the propaganda has to be changed and all animals just swallow that that's that's very annoying but the the worst part of it is that napoleon in the end actually gets fooled he sells his timber for counterfeit money, counterfeited money, and as if it's not enough, the farmer he sent he sold his timber to starts a war with him, right? So uh, it's not necessarily a war because on this scale it's just just a single battle, but it's a, a lot 
harsher. It's a lot more scarier. It's way rougher than the previous battle. The previous battle looked quite awful. But now it is just brutal. So animals are forced to retreat. Then humans out of spite destroy the meal. The meal that they just finished constructing. Just out of spite. Destroy it absolutely. And this was a mistake. This enraged animals and they kicked all humans out of the of the farm and I think that this time it actually was with casualties a lot of them on both sides it's, it was described well if the first battle battle of the cow shed uh, was described rather naive and uh, more or less harmless so yeah one ship has died but it wasn't introduced as something extremely horrifying as a full-out war for extermination but this one was and this is absolutely well depressing and brutal uh, because well obviously that this is an allegory for the Second World War. Uh, it's uh, analogous with uh, uh, the famous, infamous uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact when the uh, Soviet Union struck a deal with uh, Germany and they were betrayed. Stalin and his uh, government was betrayed by Germany and uh, the war that took place on the territory of Soviet Union was absolutely brutal terrifying and with lots of casualties well this is it's it's not it's not a coincidence that this is one of the most praised national holidays in Russia still because th the memories that were told and retold many times are kept alive because of uh, how brutal and terrifying all of that was and of course Napoleon took all credit for the victory in this case just as Stalin took all the credit for the victory in case of uh, Second World War, and uh, I, I saw I saw a video a while ago uh, of the first Victory Day march when one of the field marshals uh, spoke before soldiers on the red square and he gave so much flattery and insincere praise to Stalin that it was uncomfortable to watch so I absolutely see that the the person who spoke had has been forced to 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 do so while Stalin stayed there silent with dead eyes with his dead eyes and just watching like like a hawk or something and this is this is brutal and of course I I suspect that George Orwell he, he, I suspect that he started to write this way before uh, the Second World War ended. But as it was first published on the end of the summer of 1945, 
I think that some of the details could have been added exactly after the end of Second World War and what happens there. In celebration of the victory uh, of the Battle of uh, of the Windmill, as it is the Second War was called, uh, Napoleon was introduced to alcohol, and of course, he shows absolutely zero self-control. He drinks himself almost to death. He has a terrible hangover. He th he thinks that he is dying, and he makes a lot of fuss about it. And this is the only relief that we had in chapter eight, because well, this was shown in somewhat humorous manner so yeah but uh, napoleon does a lot of silly things with that he arranges his funeral he well uh, not arranges he plans for something like that there is a lot of talk about that animals being so fooled by uh, their government do not know what even to to think about what would happen if Napoleon will die, except well, for obviously the the whole animal farm would be better off without Napoleon. But Napoleon unfortunately gets well, and first thing first, he changes decree about no animals should drink alcohol because previously Napoleon. Silently, of course, broke this commandment because none of the commandments are written to stop Napoleon from doing something, God forbid. Uh, and he adds another counterfeit to excess. No animal shall drink alcohol to excess. And of course, he loves alcohol so much that he decides to take away the pasture, the the one that was in Orchid. Uh, that was sort of haven for tired animals, tired from work. And he just straight takes away his pasture and decides to sow it with barley to obviously distill alcohol for himself. So this chapter and my summary over this chapter is mostly just a quick a recap of what exactly happened here which is not a good review i would say it's just a short retelling the story but unfortunately at this moment there is not enough details to to say something the author did an excellent job he didn't show what he thinks about it he just laid out some events which were arranged very believably and he, he doesn't do it in the way of how, you know, the straw man fallacy is performed. So it's not like there is an obvious good choice, an obvious bad choice, and bad guy, of course, goes for the bad choice, and good guys suffer from it. But we, as readers, we know that if we were on the play in the place of the good guys, we would do something different and make it right. This this is not applicable here. It's at the point when these horrors start to happen. It's already, if not too late to do something, then it's going to be extremely hard to do something about it. And lots of people will have to suffer for it. They would suffer if they would do something about the situation. And they would suffer if they wouldn't do that. So the situation is absolutely horrific. And whatever lesson I can extract from that is that we have to be extremely attentive to what the government does and says and regulates and and we have to demand some explanations 
about everything, about the tiniest detail, about simplest facts, even if you are able to rationalize some decisions that was made by government, but the rationalizing wasn't done on the paper, so government didn't provide exact reasons, exact measures, and just says, trust us. Well, this is a moment to 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 start an alarm and to the exactly opposite to just start asking questions and trying to keep government in check all the time. So, with all that being said, with all that uh, quick recapture introduction for the previous chapter, let's get to the chapter 9. I can't wait to see uh, how hard it, is be, it will be to, to finish it. So, Boxer's split hoof was a long time in healing. They had started the rebuilding of the windmill the day after the victory celebrations were ended. Boxer refused to take even a day of work and made a point he made it a point of honor not to let it be seen that he was in pain. In the evenings, he would admit privately to Clover that the hoof troubled him a great deal. Clover treated the hoof with poultices of herbs, which she prepared by chewing them, and both she and Benjamin urged Boxer to work less hard. A horse's lungs do not last forever, she said to him, but Boxer would not listen. He had, she, he, had he said, only one real ambition left, to see the windmill well underway before he reaches the age for retirement. I, I doubt that he would enjoy his retirement. At the beginning, when the laws of Animal Farm were, being, were first formulated, the retiring age has been fixed for horses and pigs at 12, for cows at 14, for dogs at 9, for sheep at, 11, uh, at 7, and for hens and geese at 5. Liberal old-age pensions had been agreed upon. As yet, no animal had actually retired on pension, but of late the subject had been discussed more and more. Now that the same, the small field beyond the orchard had been set aside for barley, it was rumored that a corner of the large pasture was to be fenced off and turned into a gazing ground for superannuated, superannuated animals. For a horse it was set, the pension would be 5 pounds of corn a day and, in winter, 15 pounds of hay, with a carrot or possibly an apple on public holidays. Boxer's 12th birthday was due in the late summer of the following year. Meanwhile, life was hard. The winter was as cold as the last one had been, and food was even shorter. Once again, all rations were reduced, except those of the pigs and the dogs. As too rigid equality in rations, a too rigid equality in rations, Schuller explained, would have been contrary to the principle of animalism. In any case, he had no difficulty in proving to the other animals that they were not in reality short of food, whatever the appearances might be. For the time being, certainly, it had been found necessary to make readjustments of rations. Schuller always spoke of it as readjustment, never as reduction. But in comparison with the days of Jones, the improvement was enormous. Reading out the figures in a shrill, rapid voice, he proved to them in detail that they had more oats, more hay, more turnips than they had had in John's day, that they worked shorter hours, that their drinking water was of better quality, that they lived longer, that a large proportion of their young ones survived infancy, and that they had more straw in their stalls and suffered less from fleas. The animals believed every word of it. Truth to tell, Jones and all he stood for has almost faded out of their memories. They knew that life nowadays was harsh and bare, that they were often hungry and often cold, and that they were usually working when they were not asleep. But doubtless it had been worse in the old days. They were glad to believe so. Besides, in those days they had been slaves, and now they were free, and that made all the difference, as Quiller did not fail to point out. There were many more mouths to feed now. In the autumn, the four souls had all littered about simultaneously, producing 31 young pigs between them. 
the young pigs were pie bold, and as Napoleon was the only boy on the farm, it was possible to guess at their parentage. It was announced that later, when bricks and timber had been purchased, a schoolroom would be built in the farmhouse garden. For the time being, the young pigs were given their instructions by Napoleon himself in the farmhouse kitchen. Oh well, he, whatever he does, the one thing that he actually cared about is how to raise new generation. He did excellent job, an excellent job with training the dogs. But of course, those dogs are evil now. They follow his commands. They execute his enemies. So it's safe to assume that if he is trying to raise pigs who are the intellectual brain force of the farm, he would raise them to be his lackeys, his workers of propaganda machine. They took their exercise in the garden and were discouraged from playing with the other young animals. About this time too, it was laid down as a rule that when a pig and any other animal meet on the path, the other animal must stand aside. And also that all pigs of whatever degree were to have the privilege of wearing green ribbons on their tails on Sundays. This is awful. The farm had had a fairly successful year but was still short of money. There were the bricks, sand, and lime for the schoolroom to be purchased, and it would be also necessary to begin saving up again for the machinery of the windmill. Then there were lamp oil and candles for the house, sugar for Napoleon's own table. He forbade this to the other pigs on the ground that it made them fat. And all the usual replacements, such as tools, nails, string, coal, wire, scrap iron, and dog biscuit. A stump of hay and a part of the potato crop were sold off, and the contract for eggs was increased to 600 a week. So that, that, they, so that that year, the hens barely hatched enough chicks to keep their numbers at the same level. Rations reduced in December were reduced again in February, and lanterns in the stalls were forbidden to save oil. But the pigs seemed comfortable enough, and in fact were putting on weight, if anything. One afternoon in late February, a warm, rich, appetizing scent such as the animals had never smelled before wafted itself across the yard from the little brew house, which had been discussed in John's times, disused in John's times, and which stood beyond the kitchen. Someone said it was the smell of cooking barley. The animals sniffed the air hungrily and wondered whether a warm mush was being prepared for their supper. But no warm mush appeared. And on the following Sunday, it was announced that from now onwards, all barley would be preserved for the pigs. The field beyond the orchard had already been sown with barley, and the news soon leaked out that every pig was now receiving a ration of a pint of beer daily. It's half a gallon for Napoleon himself which was always served to him in the Crown Derby Soup Turin. But if there were hardships to be borne, they were partly offset by the fact that life nowadays had a great dignity than it had had before. There were more songs, more speeches, more processions. Napoleon had commanded that once a week there should be held something called a spontaneous demonstration, the object of which was to celebrate the struggles and triumphs of animal farm. At the appointed time, the animals would leave their work and march around the precincts of the farm in military formations, with the pigs leading, then the horses, then the cows, then the sheep, and then the poultry. The dogs flanked the procession, and at the head of the mar- of all marched Napoleon's black cockerel. Boxer and clover always carried between them a green banner marked with the hoof and the horn and the caption, Long live Comrade Napoleon. Afterwards, there were recitations of poems composed in Napoleon's honor, and a speech by Squiller giving particulars of the latest increases in the production of foodstuffs, and on occasion a shot was fired from the gun. 
the sheep were the greatest devotees of the spontaneous demonstration, and if anyone complained, as a few animals sometimes did when no pigs or dogs were near, that they wasted time and meant a lot of standing about in the cold, the sheep were sure to silence him with a tremendous bleating of four legs good, two legs bad. But by any large, the animals enjoyed those celebrations. They found it comforting to be reminded that, after all, they were truly their own masters and that the work they did was for their own benefit. So that with the songs, the processions, squealers' lists of figures, the thunder of the guns, the crowning of the cockerel and the fluttering of the flag, they were all able to forget that their bellies were empty at least part of the time. In April, Animal Farm was proclaimed a republic and it became necessary to elect a president. There was only one candidate, Napoleon, who was elected unanimously. On the same day, it was given out that the fresh documents had been discovered which revealed further details about Snowball's complicity, complicity with Jones. It now appeared that the Snowball had not, as the animals had previously imagined, merely attempted to lose the battle of the cowshed by means of strateg strategy, but had been openly fighting on John's side. In fact, it was he who had actually been the leader of the human forces and had charged into the battle with the words long live humanity on his lips. The wounds on Snowball's back, which a few of the animals still remembered to have seen, had been inflicted by, Napoleon, by Napoleon's teeth. Uh, this is... It's hard to read it. In the middle of the summer, Moses the Raven suddenly reappeared on the farm after an absence, absence of several years. He was quite unchanged, still did no work, and talked in the same strain as ever about Sugar Candy Mountain. Excuse me. He would perch on a stamp flap his black wings, and talk by the hour to anyone who would listen. Up there, comrades, he would say solemnly, pointing to the sky with his large beak. Up there, just on the other side of that dark cloud that you can see, there it lies, Sugar Candy Mountain, that happy country, country where we poor animals shall rest for even from our labors, forever from our labors. He even claimed to have been there on one of his higher flights, and to have seen the everlasting fields of clover and the lean seed cake and lump sugar growing on the hedges. Many of the animals believed him. Their lives now, their reason, to were hungry and laborious. Was it not right and just that a better world should exist somewhere else? A thing that was difficult to determine was the attitude of the pigs towards Moses. They all declared contemptuously that his stories about Sugar Candy Mountain were lies, and yet they allowed him to remain on the farm, not working, with an allowance of a gill of beer a day. I think this is an analogy about the collision between the church and government in early days of Soviet Union. Not actually early, but rather post-Second World War days. I I don't want to think about it <laughs> right now, but yeah, this is hard. Uh, this this chapter is quite big. After his hoof had been healed up, Boxer worked harder than ever. Indeed, all the animals worked like slaves that year. Apart from the regular work of the farm and the rebuilding of the windmill, there was a schoolhouse for the young pigs, which was started in March. Sometimes the long hours of insufficient food were hard to bear, but Boxer never faltered. In nothing that he said or did was there any sign that his strength was not what it had been. It was only his appearance that was a little altered. His height was less shiny than it had used to be, and his great haunches seemed to have shrunken. The others said Boxer will pick up when the spring grass comes on, but the spring came and Boxer grew no fatter. Sometimes on the slope leading to the top of the quarry, 
when he braced his muscles against the weight of some vast boulders, it seemed that nothing kept him on his feet except the will to continue. At such times his lips were seen to form the words, I will work harder, he had no voice left. Once again Clover and Benjamin warned him to take care of his health, but Boxer paid no attention, his twelfth birthday was approaching. He did not care what happened so as long as a good store of stone was accumulated before he went on pension. Late one evening in the summer a sudden rumor ran around the farm that something had happened to Boxer. He had gone out alone to drag a lot of stone down to the windmill. And sure enough, the rumor was true. A few minutes later, two pigeons came racing in with the news. Boxer has fallen, he is lying on his side and can't get up. About half the animals on the farm rushed onto the knoll where the windmill stood. There lay Boxer between the shafts of the cart, his neck stretched out, unable to even raise his head. His eyes were glazed, his sides mattered with sweat. A thin stream of blood had trickled out of his mouth. Clover dropped to her knees at his side. Boxer, she cried. How are you? It is my lungs, said Boxer in a weak voice. It does not matter. I think you will all be able to finish the windmill without me. There is a pretty good store of stone accumulated. I had only another month to go in any case. To tell you the truth, I had been looking forward to my retirement. And perhaps, as Benjamin is growing old too, they will let him retire at the same time and be a companion to me. We must get help at once, said Clover. Run somebody and tell Squiller what happened, what has happened. All other animals immediately raced back to the farmhouse to give Squiller the news. Only Clover remained, and Benjamin, who lay down at Boxer's side, and without speaking, kept the flies off him with his long tail. After about a quarter of an hour, Squiller appeared, full of sympathy and concern. He said that Comrade Napoleon had learned with the very deepest distress of, his, of this misfortune to one of the most loyal workers on the farm, and was already making arrangements to send Boxer to be treated in the hospital at Willingdon. I don't trust it. The animals felt a little uneasy at this, except for Molly and Snowball. No other animal had ever left the farm. And they did not like to think that of their sick comrade in the hands of human beings. However, Schuller easily convinced them that the veterinary surgeon in Willington could treat Boxer's case more satisfactorily than could be done on the farm. And about half an hour later, when Boxer had somewhat recovered, he was with difficulty got on to his feet and managed to limp back to his stall, where Clover and Benjamin had prepared a good bed to, of straw for him. For the next two days, Boxer remained in his stall. The pigs had sent out a large bottle of pink medicine, which they had found in the medicine chest in the bathroom, and Clover administered it to Boxer's, Boxer twice a day after meals. In the evenings, she lay in, the, in his stall and talked to him, while Benjamin kept the flies off him. Boxer professed not to be sorry for what had happened. If he made a good recovery, he might expect to live another three years and he looked forward to the peaceful days that he would spend in the corner of the big pasture. It would be the first time that he had had leisure to study and improve his mind. He intended, he said, to devote the rest of his life to learning the remaining 22 letters of the alphabet. However, Benjamin and Clover could only be with Boxer after working hours, and it was in the middle of the day when the van came to take him away. The animals were all at work, weeding turnips under the supervision of a pig, when they were astonished to see Benjamin come galloping from the direction of the farm buildings, braying at the top of his voice. It was the first time that they had ever seen Benjamin excited. Indeed, it was the first time that anyone had ever seen him gallop. Quick, quick, he shouted, come at once. They are taking Boxer away. Without waiting for orders from the pigs, the animals broke off work and raced back to farm buildings. Sure enough, there in the yard was a close, clo large closed van, drawn by two horses with lettering on its side and a sly-looking man in a low-crowned bowler hat sitting on the driver's seat. And Boxer's stall was empty. The animals crowded round, crowd round the van. 
Goodbye, boxer. They chorused. Chorused. Goodbye. Fools! Fools! shouted Benjamin, prancing around and stamping the earth with his small hoofs. Fools! Do you not see what is written on the side of the van? That gave the animals pause. And there was a hush. Muriel began to spell out the words. But Benjamin pushed her aside in the midst of the deadly science he read. Alfred Simmons, horse slaughterer and glue boiler. Willingdon, dealer in heights and bone meal. Kennels supplied. Do you not understand what that means? They are taking Boxer to the knackers. A cry of horror burst from all the animals. At this moment, the man on the box whipped up his horses and the van moved out of the yard at a smart trot. All the animals followed, crying out at the top of their voices. Clover forced her way to the front. The van began to gather speed. Clover tried to steer her stout limbs to a gallop and achieved nothing. Achieved a counter. Boxer, she cried. A boxer, boxer, boxer. And just at this moment, as though he had heard the uproar outside, Boxer's face with the white stripe down his nose appeared at the small window in the back of the van. Boxer, cried Clover in a terrible voice. Boxer, get out, get out quickly. They are taking you to your death. All the animals took up the cry of get out, Boxer, get out, but the van was already gathering speed and drawing the wave from them. It was uncertain whether Boxer had understood that Clover had said. But a moment later, his face disappeared from the window, and there was the sound of tremendous drumming of hoofs inside the van. He was trying to kick his way out. The time had been when a few kicks from Boxer's hoof, hoofs would have smashed the van to much wood, but alas, his strength had left him, and in a few moments the sound of drumming hoofs grew fainter and died away. In desperation, the animals began appealing to the two horses which drew the van to stop. Comrades, comrades, they shouted, do not take your own brother to his death. But the stupid brutes, too ignorant to realize that what happened, merely sat back in their ears and quickened their pace. Boxer's face did not reappear at the window. Too late, someone thought of racing ahead and shutting the five barred gate. But in another moment, the van was through it and rapidly disappearing down the road. The boxer was never seen again. Three days later, it was announced that he had died in the hospital at Willington, in spite of receiving every attention a horse could have. Squiller came to announce the news to the others. He had, he said, been present during Boxer's last hours. It was the most affecting sight I have ever seen, said Squiller, lifting his trotter and wiping away a tear. I was at his bedside at the very last. And at the end, almost too weak to speak, he whispered in my ears that his sole sorrow was to have passed on before the windmill was fi finished. Forward, comrades, he whispered forward in the name of the rebellion, long live Animal Farm, long live comrade Napoleon. Napoleon is always right. Those were his very last co words, comrades. Here, Squiller's demeanor suddenly changed. He fell silent for a moment, and his little eyes darted suspicious glances from side to side before he proceeded. It had come to his knowledge, he said, that a foolish and wicked rumor had been circulated at the time of Boxer's removal. Some of animals had noticed that the one which took Boxer away was marked horse slaughterer, and had actually jumped to the conclusion that Boxer was being sent to the knackers. It was almost unbelievable, said Squiller, that any animal could be so stupid. Surely, he cried indignantly, whisking his tail and skipping from side to side. Surely they knew their beloved leader, Comrade Napoleon, better than that? But the explanation was really very simple. The one had previously been the property of Necker and had been brought by the veterinary surgeon, who had not yet painted the old name out. That was how the mistake had arisen. The animals were enormously relieved to hear this. And when Squiller went out, went on to give further graphic details of Boxer's deathbed, the admirable care he had received, and the expensive medicine for which Napoleon had paid without a thought as to the cost, their last doubts disappeared, and the sorrow that they felt for their comrade's death 
was tempered by the thought that at least he had died happy. Napoleon himself appeared at the meeting of the following Sunday morning and pronounced a short oration in the boxer's honor. It had not been possible, he said, to bring back their lament comrades' remains for interment on the farm, but he had ordered a large wreath to be made from the laurels in the farmhouse garden and sent down to be placed on boxer's grave. And in a few days' time, the pigs intended to hold a memorial banquet in Boxer's honor. Napoleon ended his speech without, with a reminder of Boxer's two favorite maxims. I will work harder, and Comrade Napoleon is always right. Maxims, he said, which every animal should do well to adopt as his own. As his own. On the day appointed for the banquet, a grocer's van drove up the Willingdon and delivered a large wooden crate at the farmhouse. That night, there was a sound of uproarious singing, which was followed by what sounded like a violent quarrel and ended up at about 11 o'clock with a tremendous cr crack, crash of glass. No one stirred in the farmhouse before noon on the following day, and the word went round that from somewhere or other the pigs had acquired the money to buy themselves another case of whiskey. Well, I tried to read it with little to no pauses. Because again, this... Th this is uh, another very hard to read chapter. The betrayal of Boxer, the lies that surrounded them, the callous practicality of Napoleon, which I, I, I don't even know what to say about it. He was ready to get rid of Boxer because he dared to question some of the propaganda back at, in the chapter 7. when Boxer was still very healthy and very capable of work. And now that Boxer is unable to work, he was no use for Napoleon. Therefore, Napoleon decided to get rid for good from him. I, I, I knew that Napole Napoleon wouldn't let Boxer to to, to, to enjoy his pension. But the brutality is just... It's uh, heartbreaking. Once again, I am now at a loss what, what how to conclude it, what to say now. And I guess I will take another day to think about the content, contents of this chapter. And I will get back with my new notes, but I suppose that that would be also just a quick retelling the events of uh, chapter nine, because the main idea is how easy you can get betrayed by the government like this, What, what what to extract from it further? Maybe only some maybe only what are the common signs that the government the is so far beyond the saving that it would just straight betray the most loyal servants, workers, comrades. Is there such a lesson to be extracted from this chapter? I'm not sure yet, but I will try. With that being said, 
I thank you all for joining me today and I'll see you sometime soon.